So the first uh, session is on type 1 diabetes in girls and women. Ma'am, do you want to join me here? <laughs> yeah, we'll call the technician. From here, we'll yeah. take it forward? Right. Which I thought extend for. So may I now request Professor Nikhil Tandon to join us on stage. Thank Good you for being here, sir. Thank you. May I request Professor Maitli to join us? May I request Dr. Archana Sarda to join us? She miss uh, Priyanka. May I request uh, Dr. Priyanka Padi to join us? May I request Ms. Shilpa Dr. Joshi, Shilpa. Dr. Shilpa Joshi to join us? So, uh, Professor Nikhil Tandon needs no introduction. He's Professor of Endocrinology in Delhi. Uh, Dr. Maithili is a Professor of Endocrinology in Vizard, and now uh, she's enjoying her um, time teaching students when she wants to and doing endocrinology when she likes. Uh, the Dr. Um, Shilpa Joshi, everybody knows. She's the Vice President and President, all kinds of positions held in the All India Dietic Association, and everybody knows her. And uh, we have Dr. Archana Sarda, who's doing fantastic work with um, type 1 diabetes girls, and she'll be adding a lot to our knowledge today. Dr. Priyanka Bhadi is joining us for the first time. She's a psychologist uh, who's going to shed a lot of light on uh, aspects of emotional support, which are relevant while we're all continuing to care for girls and women with type 1 diabetes. So over to Dr. Meena to start with the first question. So good morning, and it's a very warm welcome to all of you. So to set the ball rolling, my first question to Professor Nikhil Tandon is, do you think type 1 diabetes is different in girls and women? So when we use the word different, um, so are we saying does it come earlier? Does it, is it more severe? Are the complication rates different? Um, are any other management issues specifically different? I think the data for that are um, a little variable. Um, clearly issues like DK for reasons not totally clear are marginally more Clearly issues like the impact of their diabetes on pubertal development are there. Uh, for example, if you take a cohort of, of girls who develop their type 1 diabetes before entering into puberty and you compare girls who had their type 1 diabetes after going into puberty, you'll see significant differences in the evolution of puberty out there. So, you know, puberty, there will be, it's not massive, but there will be a definite delay in the evolution of puberty. There will be a slight delay in the onset of menarche, which has been clearly demonstrated. And uh, I think, to, to, if I just stay on the pubertal issues for a moment, um, it's, it's rather clear that it possibly links to the poor glycemic control contributing to BMI and body fat, which, as you know, is a great uh, in, has a great influence on pubertal evolution and you know the reaching menarche. So, if there's a significantly poorly controlled person, the likelihood of them developing menarche on time therefore becomes clearly very late. Now, in terms of overall management issues, I think those are. They're both biological and non-biological phenomena, and sometimes I think, uh, as as practicing sort of physicians, we tend to dwell too much on the biological component, and not realizing that there's a significant sort of sort of non-biological social component which comes into play, especially how um, how much assistance and support a young child who is a girl child is getting in the management of their disease. Um, and therefore, is it, if, if you compare it, especially we're now talking entirely of an Indian setting, not, not sort of international or Western data, is it the same degree of support which a boy child would have got? Is it the same degree of uh, uh, sort Bishan. of understanding of circumstances in which they have to deal? Morning, Banshi. Uh, in, in which they are being looked after. 
So I think that then will have a lot of influence or impact on the way their disease is being managed and the likelihood of, of them getting into difficulty. So that, I think there are differences uh, which, are, which are accounted partly by biological phenomenon, but at least in our setting also significantly by non-biological factors. So Dr. Nikhil, you're trying to say that it's not a, just a, a biological issue of a boy or a girl, but there is also a gender or a social uh, issue, which is important. Uh, what about antibodies? Uh, is it, uh, you said that girls are younger. Is it okay, girls are younger when they develop type one? Um. I honestly, there are some data. I'm not sure how much of a difference it's going to make because it's not like it's not like in years. It'll be in terms of months. Uh, I'm not sure. I must confess, I'm not familiar with antibody data which is showing any major difference in prevalence. But you know, perhaps there are. I personally don't recall. In our own sort of cohort of youth onset type one diabetes, nothing dramatic came out in terms of either the sort of the, the the number of antibodies the profile of antibodies and the titer of antibodies and that's what i can remember from our own data set but if there are other data i'd be happy to learn so i think my question here is how many antibodies are we doing because <clears throat> even in a place a metro city like delhi we are able to do gat 65 and at best sometimes ia2 or insulinoma associated antibody 2 so is your institute doing the zinc transporter 8 antibodies and the ice insulin antibodies so you can do any sort of antibody the question is uh, remember i come i come from uh, uh, from an institution which sort of caters to an or caters to a, a socioeconomic profile where you know getting too many investigations is often not possible so whatever is possible we do right so in terms of let me first answer whether we do all of those yes we do all of those right but we do all of those as a part of a larger research effort and now there's a confluence between our research effort and our patient care management services so yes if you want to ask me whether we have data we have data on all GAD, IA2, and zinc transporter rate for all my young onset type 2 diabetes and we have sequential data but the important thing is, do you need it, right? Now, if you if you really look at the clinical profile of somebody who's presenting, a young, lean person who's presenting with diet ketoacidosis, uh, yes, you can get a GAT65 done. It's perhaps the most useful thing to get done. But I'm not sure if in terms of their management will make a spectacular difference. It's reassuring, you know what is a disease. Sometimes you sit with this person who's a little older, not classically thin, features of insulin resistance also creeping in. You don't know whether it's a mixed picture, you don't know whether it's a variant in which the first presentation of a type two came with DK and you don't know what's gonna happen later. It really helps in those circumstances. So, you know, and if you have a, have a profile which is not a clear phenotypic profile, but in the ones in which there's very, very, there's clarity. I mean, if you've got to, you know, remember, I have to always look at how to save money for myself and save money for my patient. And if that's what's happening, then I think it's important for me to spend that money on getting more facilities. I would say getting them a year's monitoring equipment would be more useful for my patient than being told whether they have a GAD 65 or not. I'm sorry, I'm not being dismissive at all. It's just the practical reality of, uh, of you know, the system in which I function. So I think I agree that if the diagnosis of type 1 is very clear, it's a young child presenting with DK, there's no need. But then, uh, do you think a false label of type 1B? We do say idiopathic in India. Is it because we are not doing enough antibodies that we call them idiopathic or type 1B and they are in reality type 1? A or antibody positive. Right. So if you look, so I can quote from two studies. Both of the studies where I'm quoting were done at Sanjay Gandhi PGI. And now we have our own data, which is as yet unpublished, but which is now available, which is perhaps larger because we all. So there was a paper in Diabetes Care, which was a letter which uh, was published by Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Bhatia and Dr. Ish Bhatia and other colleagues, which essentially looked at a bunch of people within six months of their diagnosis. And this was, I think, patients from other institutions also. And only 50% of them really had GAD65, which was positive, right? However, 
However, a more recent paper, I think it was 2021 in pediatric diabetes, again from Sanjay Gandhi PGI, when it added GAD and IA2 and zinc transporter 8, that number rose to about 75% of there. So, you know, even if you look at Western, Western data, it's about 90%. So, the belief that we were very different, I think that belief has shrunk to say, yes, they may be slightly lower, but it's not as dramatically different as what, and, if, and, and I would say the same thing for what we are observing, we have now data on about 500 yeah, type Yeah, we are a part ones. of the YDR, yeah. the Young yeah. Diabetes yeah. Registry yeah. ICMR. Yeah. Okay, so we, I think we move we ahead to Dr. Archana Sharda. Uh, thanks, yeah. Dr. Archana. So uh, we've understood the difference between uh, biological sex and maybe gender. Can I ask you to shed light on maybe the gender differences between how diabetes pans out in girls versus boys? I know you're doing a lot of work and could you maybe touch upon uh, some of the struggles that they might have during marriage or abandonment as a girl child with type 1 diabetes? Over to you, Dr. Archana. Thank you. I think as uh, Sir mentioned that there are other factors other than the medical factors and those are the factors we can look at from the gender lens. So uh, at the outset I would also like to put it on an optimistic note that in the last 20 years there has definitely been an improvement. Okay. So what we saw 20 years back and what we are seeing today, there is definitely less bias, more access, uh, less discrimination as compared to 20 years ago when I started working in a type. So it is promising and we'll get there. But having said that, um, if I look at it in a chronological, from an age group point of view, what we find is uh, the little ones, whether it's a boy or a girl, the acceptance, the access, everything is pretty much the same. Correct. When a girl comes or a boy comes, four years old, three years old, it's pretty much similar, the kind of trauma parents go through, the kind of effort they go through. But then the scenario changes uh, in the cabin when the doctor, the patient comes in, the parents come in, the first thing they ask for a girl child, no matter how old she is, even if she's a one-year-old girl, is, is my daughter going to get married? Correct. I have yet, non, not in my 1,100 kids that we support in 20 years, met a single parent, irrespective of their education status, financial status, uh, low socioeconomic levels, but the first concern is this, is this child going to get married? If yes, can she bear children? If yes, will her children have diabetes? Correct. So it's, um, I mean, the first thing when a parent asks that is kind of, uh, you know, you get taken aback, but now we are used to it, that being their prime concern. Having said that, uh, once the children grow up in the pubertal age, we find there's a lot of difference that comes in within families when we see boys versus girls. So as puberty approaches, it's very, very exhaustive where the girl child has type 1 diabetes. And we have seen mothers who are just so um, almost given up. Mm. And surprisingly, not the f uh, it's a mother who is almost abandoning the child. Yeah. It's, they're not able to cope the whole fear, the trauma of what can happen to my girl. I know parents who have locked up their daughter in the room because they're really scared that uh, what will happen if we let her go out. And uh, that trauma increases as her age increases because there's a lot of social stigma. Uh, the second thing that happens is in school. We have found that school authorities are more willing to take care of a child, a boy with type 1 diabetes, to support a boy with diabetes, but they always say, oh, but she's a girl, where will we give her space to take Correct. her insulin injection, the privacy, and they have a lot of questions. They so accommodate the boys easier. Easier. Okay. They do accommodate, ultimately schools do, but Correct. it takes a little more convincing, coaxing. a little more questions, coaxing, Correct. all kind of things when it comes to a girl child. But ultimately the main thing comes when the girl grows up and it's marriage time and that is yet a trauma. Correct. And uh, so the entire focus, we found uh, a shift happens when you do not focus on the marriage as the end point of life. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of hand holding, a lot of convincing. So what we found works is telling them that uh, the first thing is make them capable. You know, stand up. It's a general thing, we understand that, but it's so much more difficult 
to convert. Because, uh, for example, the somebody is visiting at home and the girl child has type 1 diabetes, they will hide the insulin. Mm. They will probably skip some insulin doses. Right. So um, it's a lot of trauma. Another thing is lack of involvement from the father and grandparents. Correct. Again, we actually studied that. I have an equal number of boys and girls. And uh, the father and grandparents actually uh, support less when it comes to a girl child. Even the mother, if she's fully dedicated, she's taking all the good care for a child, but the family support is much less when it comes to a girl. So there is still discrimination. And I'm not even talking about just the lower socioeconomic strata. To be honest, I have seen the rural kids in villages with very low resources being much more better capable about it and accepting it better, getting married easier, as compared to the educated, the urban, um, the better resort. So it wasn't always a socioeconomic divide. That Those we are interesting. Did. So yeah. that is what we are seeing. I, I think Dr. Priyanka has some interesting thoughts to share on these topics. We'll ask her Priyanka, uh, you have worked in uh, young patients, you worked with them who have chronic illnesses. So I think you're the right person. I, and you've also worked with me and Dr. Bina Bansal with our patients. So some insights on how parents now, Arjuna mentioned grandparents. How do they help or not help in taking care of a child with type 1 diabetes, particularly a girl child? Right. I think, uh, good morning to everyone. First, uh, uh, some very interesting insights that have already been shared by Dr. Sharda about um, the research that has been conducted. Uh, some very similar findings, but in probably a slightly different context. Um, I'll come to what uh, uh, ma'am is asking about in terms of how the family supports. But I think it's uh, important to begin by, uh, I, I would like to bring in something that Arthur Kleinman, who's a sociologist, uh, you know, talked about in terms of differentiating between disease, illness, and suffering. Um, and in, in doing that, so basically when we are talking about the disease, it's the biological, the biological correlates or the biological basis. When we start talking about the illness, we are talking about the personal or what, what the individual goes through. And that's quite different from the disease itself. And then we talk about um, you know, how sickness is, the third term is sickness, which is how the society around deals with that. I think that's the focus that we are talking about today. And already, both my the speakers before me, they've already um, you know, talked about this, that the social aspect, how the implicit and the explicit messages that are being communicated to these growing up girls from people around them, those are very powerful messages. And those are things that they permeate the being, and they are internalized in a manner that they shape the entire sense of self. One of the very important findings of my research was whether the child is able to think of them themselves beyond the illness. Correct. Is their self-definition something which is only limited to having diabetes, or does it go beyond that? And I, one of the things that we saw very clearly is that when these kinds of messages are being given, a young child brought, being brought to a doctor, and the first question that is being asked is whether the child will be able to get married, uh, and have children in the future. These are things that are internalized very early. And that's why you'll see that the, the self-definition also then gets entirely uh, around the disease itself. There is no self-definition beyond that. And that is really quite a, um, you know, that makes the difference in terms of being resilient, which is what the focus of my study was. Okay. I'll also share certain findings pertaining to, um, you know, the, the perceived social supports uh, by girls and boys with uh, type uh, 1 diabetes. Can I but just interrupt, Dr. Priyanka? Yeah. We will come, we have a question on, a on support that. systems and we'll uh, take all your insights. If I could just switch gears a little bit um, and then ask uh, Professor uh, Banshi Sabu to take this question on does has the incidence of type 1 diabetes changed post COVID? We do know that newly detected diabetes is reported to be higher post COVID, but does it affect even type 1 diabetes incidence? So data from India after post-COVID, particularly the incidence of type 1 diabetes has not been there. It's not released or published. But definitely, as we know, that immunity is changing post-COVID. And there is a possibility that you can have more increase in that. There is also a possibility that we are now getting more patients, maybe because of more uh, 
awareness post covid particularly for diabetes so post covid type 1 diabetes scenario one thing which i am seeing is being a diabetologist getting more patient that does not mean that it is actually changed the incidence wise but definitely care for type 1 diabetes post covid yes. is changed yes. definitely Got because it. it is improving care people understand uh, started understanding that covid had created more problem with those who were having diabetes and Correct. uncontrolled diabetes Correct. and that's the reason probably across the country all diabetologists and endocrinologists now started seeing more number of patients whether it's a type 1 and type 2 so overall uh, we may say that number of patients reaching to the specialist doctor and specialist doctor increase post covid also but uh, the data published from india as far as incidence of type 1 diabetes post covid is not much changed so anything from the global data there seems to be some evidence yes so the global well. data they had published from the even from our sweet registry also they tried to find out and there is a uh, one paper which is going to come uh, from the sweet data across the world that post covid those who have history of covid and then they have been detected and then simultaneously we are also trying to find out uh, the normal incidence and there we had since there is a slight increase Uh, and pattern is seeing and changes across the world right and uh, this age group which is increasing is between around 9 to 14 uh, in that age group they found that there is a slight more okay. increase uh, in incidence of uh, type 1 diabetes post covid thank you uh, i think uh, dr bansi uh, none of my type 1 patient uh, diabetic patients did badly in covid which was surprising because we were getting news from us and uk so there are two things i put one is that uh, patients of type 1 there have lived longer so probably they had more micro and macrovascular complications and therefore they succumb to covid but here our type 1s are so much younger and with not such long standing diabetes and i don't think there was any increase in mortality at least none of my patients they all ha- most of them had covid but they but were young they were not having the long standing type 1 diabetes no, some of them did so it uh, so i don't know if they they actually did badly or not type 1s yes no, no long standing type 1 diabetes patient have done no, badly no particularly those with complications uh-huh. right so i think but uh, professor nikhil would you like to add there are certain viruses like coxsackie b virus or other viruses and finland which has a very high incidence of type 1 probably uh, the hygiene theory so could you just elaborate on so so there've been these theories which have gone around and round in circles for a very long time and and i think one of the important as you rightly pointed north of finland parts of scandinavia having a much higher uh, sort of incidence of type 1 diabetes but remember south of south of europe sardinia again also had very high so these are very interesting epidemiological observations you are again correct that uh, certain viruses have been associated with triggers uh whether there's a direct causality in terms of like for for covid the concern has obviously been that the ace2 receptor is present on the pancreatic cells and whether you can get a direct viral access and entry which can then cause uh beta cell destruction versus a viral infection which is causing an immune response which then can secondarily target so all of this has been going on but since none of those viral infections have yet been handled better with you know let's say an immunization so really there is no pre and post evaluation as to what would have happened if there was an abrogation of those viral infections in in terms of um, the hygiene theory that's again circulated around for a long time just like the uh, exposure to cow's milk protein has circulated for a very long time uh, sometimes there are other other pathogenic uh, bacteria which have been discussed really these are very interesting phenomenon to dis- to see um, there's a study which most of you would be familiar with this study which is called teddy teddy yeah. try to look at all of these things in long term and it's a lot of time effort and money which has gone in but realistically speaking uh, it's not added game changing information to us and i mean i look at ourselves as a group of basically practicing clinicians who provide care to the patient so that information is interesting intellectually and academically but again it's not really impacted on our ability to manage our patients once they're there 
So, Thank you. So, Dr. Bansi, you feel that number post-COVID has increased to the super specialists and the specialists probably because the type 1s are more aware that they should see a specialist. So, whether there's an actual increase in incidence and is not uh, yet don't clear. Tell yeah, there no we don't have any Thank registry. you for that insight. Thank you. So, if, uh, yeah, so I think we'll proceed to our next expert, Dr. Maithili. Dr. Maithili, do you feel that girls have uh, body image issues? And do you think uh, see girls with the injecting higher doses of insulin or not injecting at all because they want to lose weight? Archana did mention that they're, so do they do it? And, or do you see girls with eating disorders, type one diabetic girls? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Meena. This is a very pertinent question. So we are all aware that adolescent girls are concerned about body image. And uh, this is actually the issue that drives to eating disorders. So both are linked to one another. And then in an adolescent girl with type 1 diabetes, definitely this is much more common. And it is the, the eating disorders, the predisposing factor is mainly the negative body image, the drive for thinness. And this is what uh, leads to eating disorders. Now, having said that, there is uh, the literature says that one third of type 1 diabetes do have negative body image issues and eating disorders. But then, our own Indian data, we do not have so much of eating disorders. Maybe we are not aware. Definitely, there is a lack of awareness of eating disorders. So now, when do you suspect an eating disorder in a type 1 diabetes? An adolescent coming with recurrent episodes of decay, unexplained weight loss, excess exercise, uncontrolled diabetes, hypoglycemia. So these are all the situations where we need to suspect for eating disorders. And uh, and uh, we all are aware of uh, the eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, bulimia. But in type 1 diabetes, there is a large spectrum. The spectrum ranges from a disrupted eating pattern to a disordered eating behavior to a classical eating disorder. Now, a very unique uh, uh, eating disorder that has been uh, uh, mentioned in type 1 diabetes is what is called diabulimia. So, which means that uh, they omit insulin to control, to control weight. So, omission of insulin, poor glycemic control, and that leads to weight loss. So, this is again a very dangerous and serious issue. So I think we all need to focus on, and the ADA in 2019 started re recommending screening for all type 1 diabetes between the ages of 10 and 12 for eating disorders. So there's a simple validated questionnaire which we can use and then uh, evaluate for eating disorders. Then uh, finally, is there an impact on a health of the eating disorders? Yes, definitely. There is an implication on long and long term and short term diabetes uh, outcomes and in general health. Then, how to manage eating disorders? Uh, first and foremost, is before we say that there is an eating disorder, look at the insulin regimen. Re evaluate the insulin regimen. See that it is not improper, leading to hypoglycemia, and that is what can produce a disrupted eating pattern. So, the first thing is look, look at the organic cause for. Uh, disrupted eating and then still if then if it is excluded then maybe we are dealing with an eating disorder now secondly there are certain drugs like the glp1 receptor agonists which can regulate hunger and relieve the bulimic symptoms in uh, uh, type 1 diabetes and most important is uh, reinforce the behavioral modification and family support and finally uh, keep in mind that there are comorbid psychiatric disorders associated with eating disorders. So negative body image, uh, eating disorders, psychiatric disorders, all of these go hand in hand and all of them need to be addressed uh, together. Since we are talking about eating disorders, Dr. Shilpa, we want you to come in. Are the physicians and endocrinologists contributing to that by giving too strict a diet? Is it because we are not trained in, so we tell them cut off everything. Is that the reason and you think that the message to the audience should be more and more, you know, uh, nutritionists handling the diet aspect of the type 1 diabetic patients? 
I, I completely agree uh, with the fact that nutritionists should be handling the dietary regime of the person with type 1 diabetes. Um, also, it's very important, you know, whenever I see a child with type 1 diabetes, the first thing mother asks me is, what can I do so that my child requires minimum insulin? Kam se kam insulin deke kaam ho jayega. That's the thing, you know. So they don't, because they perceive insulin classically as medicine, because it's available at the chemist, right? So they are like, you should not medi over medicate a child, and therefore insulin is a medicine, so we don't want to give insulin. And that actually, uh, then there is very little left that a uh, child can eat because uh, uh, if the insulin is minimal. So I think it's very important that uh, that aspect, I mean, I, um, I put in a lot of energies telling them that insulin is something which is made by your pancreas and now it is not able to make, so you're supplementing it. It's not a medicine. And therefore, um, giving insulin adequately is very important rather than restricting diet because um, garden variety of diabetes is type 2 and everybody doesn't want to eat rice and uh, whatever, you know, typical foods and they want to go on a low calorie diet. So we have a lot of young children whose mother put them on a keto diet because they feel that carbs are bad, they require insulin and if you give less uh, carbs then you'll require less insulin. So I think these are things which need to be spoken to parents about because there is very little in the hands of the child themselves, you know. They are not decision makers, neither are they cooking food for themselves. So um, I think this is very important uh, to be conveyed to parents uh, initially. So do you think most of our type 1 are I, carb counting? Yes, Dr. Metley, please. Uh, to add to what uh, Shilpa mentioned, I think we all need to remember that we have nutritional issues in type 1 diabetes. Data shows that majority are uh, under underweight and they're malnourished. So this is as she has rightly pointed out, it is inadequate calories inadequate macronutrients, composition of macronutrients is also improper in, in our Indian children. Shilpa, but I think what contributes is that we always assume that food that is tasty is unhealthy. So we also need you to emphasize that to the pa patients that healthy food can be cooked, uh, you know, can be tasty as well. So I think uh, parents restrict food too much and you know, vegetarian uh, for um, patient, there's already restriction of protein. So I think, uh, please talk about a little bit about uh, healthy diet here, and uh, of course, lack of awareness is what we are trying yes. to. Yes. Uh, so I personally diet. believe that it's lack of awareness because, like I said, the whole idea that parents have is because they are taking a leaf out of what they are doing for their parents, right? Correct. So a lot of them have parents who have diabetes, and probably they have been told to eat lesser or lose some weight yeah. or something like that. So they are just taking a leaf out of there and sort of using it on their children where they are giving them super restrictive diets. So uh, like Dr. Maithili said that, you know, therefore they lose weight um, uh, they, because they, they have inadequate amount of calories that they're taking. And I'm talking about calories in total. Protein, of course. I mean, protein is a part of that. But even carbohydrates, which are so very important for a growing child, that they, they take lesser calories, lesser carbohydrates, lesser proteins, and of course, micronutrients also suffer in the bargain. And like you said, um, Tasty food, well, that's a perception, right? Uh, because in India, tasty food uh, equates to eating fried or sweet. Correct. It does not equate to eating uh, good food. So I think that whole concept of, you know, what is good, and um, it does not mean it has to be boiled. There is this whole, again, uh, misnorm among people that if it is healthy, it has to be boiled, and it can't be cooked in any fat, or things like that. So I think these are basic things uh, which one has to be made aware of and uh, 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 parents have to be spoken to about it that you know what you're doing for others in family with type 2 diabetes is not something that you need to do with the child with type 1 diabetes. Sure. Thank you uh, Dr. Shilpa. If I can switch gears and do a reality check and get, get Dr. Uh, Bansi Sabu to get his take on this. The mean HPA1C of children with type 1 diabetes um, in India and globally is definitely above uh, targets that we recommend. What do you think are the reasons and the potential solutions? Is there a need for the country to come together and make changes towards policy? 
Does it relate to access to insulin or are okay. there other factors at play? So being A1C in children is not just above recommendation. It's very, very above recommendation. <laughs> so it's not like that someone is like recommendation is 7 or less than 7 and we are getting the patients which have 7.5 or Correct. this is not like that. Average A1C of type 1 children even from the tertiary care center. So the data which is published from India from the tertiary care center is average is 9.5. The CDIC, when it was started, we're changing diabetes in children at more than 14 centers across the country. The patients who are, we were taking first 4,000, the data was showing the average evidence of these children were 10.5. And we were very happy when we could reduce it after giving them one year of free insulin, glucose meter, strip, so much education. It is around 9.5. But that further decrease from 9.5 to 9 and from 9 to 8.5, again, is really... Uh, something which we can't or we could not do it. The reasons and solution we know that one is uh, the risk of hypoglycemia. It is the hypoglycemia which is major limiting factor. A type 1 child which is normally seen by a pediatrician and a pediatrician does not want the child should go in hypoglycemia nor he wants his child should go in diabetic ketosis. Correct. So the best thing is to give a subtherapeutic dose of a, a pre-mixed insulin. The second big problem is a type 1 child developing complication after the 10 years of duration of diabetes and that's again a major challenge. So a pediatrician in his lifetime never sees any complication as far as type 1 is concerned. He sees a type 1 child coming to him at the age of 6, 7 or 8 year old and he becomes adult when he develops a microvascular complication around 16, 18 and he is going now adult endocrinologist or adult physician or somewhere where the complication specialist doctor Taking is going. Yeah. And that's the reason pediatricians are never intensively treating the diabetes. So that's the, one of the major reason for that. The second big problem, if someone had started the child with a pre-mixed insulin. So suppose now you are seeing a child after two years of diagnosis of diabetes, someone have already started him on insulin, which is maybe may not be basal bolus, may not be the newer insulin. Now to change that insulin is more difficult. Undo any design becomes more difficult. 100%. If you are getting a child which is recently detected type 1 diabetes, you are the one who is admitting the child. You are the one who is first starting the patient on basal bolus. You are the one who is giving education at the time of diabetes diagnosis itself. In first five days, seven days, the patient, patient relatives, the family is most receptive as far as uh, whatever the knowledge which we are talking to them. But after two years, three years, then they become very no, Dr. Bansi, my question is, can you dissect, you have a huge data, your sweet registry. Can you detect, uh, dissect the data and tell us that are the educated upper class with access to insulin, access to technology, doing better than children who are struggling with insulin, struggling with uh, glucose sticks, or uh, there's no such uh, connect? So, there is an educated and upper class two different things. It does not mean all upper class is educated. It does not mean the lower class or rural class cannot be educated. Right. So I mean, that distinguish, we have to make that education if we do. A education for a type 1 diabetic patients and empowering a type 1 diabetic patients definitely improves. I always say, uh, DCCT trial that you know when by getting on only NPH and R with three or four times checking the sugar, if they can keep the mean A1C was around 7.6 and they can reduce from 8, 9, 9.6 to 7.6, it means intensive control can be done without you know high by technology yeah. giving them a basal bolus insulin, checking the sugar three to four times, basic carb counting and correction dose and all those things and. With educated education, I can you can reduce the patient A1C around eight or below eight also. To achieve seven or below seven, I think the technology role of technology definitely comes. Here first is the continuous glucose monitoring, the JDR of CGM trial. After 25 years of DCCT trial, they have similar type of patients and they put the patient on continuous glucose monitoring. And with the further putting them on a pump and now like a seven ATG. Uh, you may achieve even less than 7 HP1C without getting hypoglycemia. So definitely technology role is very, very high in type 1 diabetic patients. And the hypoglycemia is a limiting factor which can be reduced significantly if they are using the 
technology and what we have started using in some of our patients. Many patients are not affording for both the things. They can't afford CGM and pump. They can't afford many things. But still those patients who are affording and those who are educated and they understand the importance of doing continuous glucose monitoring or putting them on pump, we had seen that their A1C we could reduce even less than 7. So if I see my patients, those who are with the CDIC or life for child, the average A1C of these patients is around 9 which is between 8 to 9 but around 9 not more than 10 now no more we have the patients who are coming us to regularly those patients who are using more frequent monitoring and using continuous glucose monitoring they are between 8 to 9 but there are patients who are putting on the pump also okay. the older pump they are still on 8.5 it is not like that just by getting the insulin pump now they are below 7 but now with the descent introduction we have around 22 patients to whom we have put 7 ATG pump uh, which is the recent one along with the continuous glucose monitoring and first time now I am seeing my many of my patients with the A1C of less than 7 or even 6.5 6. and two of my patients had almost 6.2 or one patient is less than 6 also. So that type of thing you can see only with this advanced technology otherwise it's not possible. But we should aim at less than 8 because any HbA1c lowering No, aim good. should be always 7 because if no. you will tell I'm the patient resource, that your aim is less than resource, 8, then resource. they will keep 10. So, yeah. I mean, if you keep the 7, well, many times when we talk the patient that, you know, even for type 2 diabetes also, that your post meal glucose should not be more than 180. I always tell not should not be more than 140 even. Because if you tell them 180, then they keep 250. 250 last time bola the normal so you know they have their own idea if you say them 140 they will try to keep it less than 100 no but i want to answer that there is a lot of uh, there's a term called diabetes distress so don't we add to the distress when dr bansi agrees that uh, without technology without multiple uh, pre meal and bedtime testing in our resource poor patients we are not able to reach 7 so I, are we contributing to diabetes distress by making them feel that well you are not at but 6 but other side you are thinking one side you are talking of increasing diabetes distress but other side you are increasing the diabetes related complication also how many of us here in this audience are having type 1 diabetes when they were detected diabetes at the age of 10 or 12 why they are not here why they are not becoming endocrine why they are not diabetologists because they have not survived and they have not survived because we were not very much you know strict to keep their A1C less than 7. If you go in a SPAD meeting you will find those who are sitting in 200 you will find 30 of them are endocrinologists, nutritionists who are interested in type 1 diabetes. Many of them are already on pump. In advisory council meeting of is bad, you will find out of 12, the four of them are four already type pump, 1. Yes. So, I mean, you are not getting those type 1 here because we were not strict. And I think we should blame ourselves. We physicians are responsible for not them to survive for 70 years. They are surviving in India, average type 1 index paper, recently published in India. It is 18 years average survival after the type 1 diabetes. I mean complication free survival. I am not talking of they are dying after 18 years of diagnosis. 18 years of type 1 diabetes then they are surviving for another 10 to 12 years with complication and by the age of 40 most of them are dying in India in type 1 diabetes. So I think Dr. Nikhil Tandon, can you just pitch in and talk to about, about uh, us about your programs, the kids program, the nurses that we need, the diabetic educators, are we lacking in all those things? So Dr. Bansi has a point, but when you are a one-man army, you're the only one seeing your patient, is it difficult to reach that magical figure of seven? Do we need more uh, help from our nutritionists, our psychologists, and our foot care specialists? your thoughts so before i do that i just want to add to what banshi is saying i think um it's if if looking at the sort of people who will let's say visit banshi's clinic um look at the sort of people who will attend a government hospital even in a metropolitan city and then look at the clientele which will come to a relatively small town who is going to a you know a lower resourced less trained center your question is absolutely valid but the question has so much granularity that we expect a single answer for that question is perhaps being unreasonable right um, it's 
you know, unless you've actually sat down with a poor patient, you will not realize the complexity of the of the whole story. Um, there are people who, you know, we've we've heard one thing about urban, metropolitan, educated, maybe socioeconomically advantaged girls who have a body image issue, who will be skipping insulin. People who are dependent on an external source for free insulin, who realize that they're running out of insulin, they've been given what they've thought was 30 days of supply, they're running out at the 24th day, they reduce the dose of insulin not because they're concerned about body image. They reduce the insulin because they do not have insulin, right? Yeah, I have a, a, two sisters who are type 1. Inject, one would inject on Monday, the other one on Tuesday yeah. because so Meena, you don't you don't represent a client. You don't represent a spectrum of uh, of physicians who looks after uh, the economic advantage primarily. I I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fact that WHO ten years ago brought up the NCD program in which they gave targets. Last year, the WHO has developed something called the Diabetes Compact, which was established uh, to mark the 100th year of insulin, uh, where a group of people within the WHO, which is we call a technical advisory group, which has come up with five targets for diabetes. I'm not talking about type 1. I'll come to the type 1 in a second. But those five targets have been refined, discussed, and now have been approved by the World Health Assembly, that means the member states have agreed that they will do that. And the five targets are, please understand that where we are coming from, because places like the World Health Assembly represent nations across the spectrum of development, resource, education, finance, and training. That, for all diabetes, for all diabetes, your target has to be that 80% of people with diabetes should know that they have diabetes. So the rule of halves has to be altered. And we're now looking at half the people with type 2 diabetes don't know they have diabetes. That has to be made into 80%. 80% of people, I, without disagreeing uh, from what, should have an A1C of less than 8%. The person is not being told that your target is 8%. Yes. The person is going to be told that their target is 6.5% or 7% or whatever it is. But the national aspiration has to be that 80% of your, of your population with diabetes should have an A1C of less than 8%. 80% of people with diabetes should have their blood pressures under 130, 80. 60% of your people with diabetes should be on statins. Let's put that aside, right? Because that also aligns, the 60% business aligns with the WHO that anybody above 40 with diabetes should be on that. But let's put it aside. 100%, please understand, it was 80%, 80%, 80%, 60%, 100% 80 of people with type 1 diabetes should have access to affordable insulin and monitoring, 100%. Please remember, World Health Assembly has agreed. That means India has agreed as a, as a member state. When, how, we don't know the answers, but 100%. So, you know, before we go into lots of complex issues, the lowest hanging fruit is can we provide insulin and monitoring? Correct. Just giving people insulin is no, no, so not going to make a huge difference. 100% should get insulin and monitoring. That's your first step. Then please understand, we again have to, there is no question about diabetes distress. There is no question about diabetes complications. One does not exclude the other, right? We must understand that for a that there will always be a tightrope, there'll always be a balance between these things. And you've got to personalize and tailor your treatment based on what who's sitting across from you, right? And that is critical. Um, you shouldn't put pressure. There may be a life phase where you don't want to add to distress, but then not emphasizing in one way or the other the requirement for good control would also be abrogating our responsibility. So that's, that's for me, it's very, very important. I'm just going to say one more thing before I come to answer what you asked. So, okay, fine. What Banshi is saying is right, 9%, 9.5%. But tell me, and I can see several of 
several people who've trained in the department who can stand up and say if I'm wrong. All the girls who had terrible sugars through their lives became pregnant and got their blood glucose in absolutely brilliant control during, yes, pregnancy. Yes. during pregnancy. Absolutely. Yes, right? Absolutely. They had the same resource, same education, same finance, same doctor, same everything. Yes. It's just because they felt it was important Relevant. to do. Yeah. Right? Yes. And a month after pregnancy, delivery, back, back. they were back to their good old ways. It was 9% to 6.5% to 9%. Yes. Nothing changed, right? Biology in terms of whether they were more resistant, more sensitive, whether they had more insulin, less insulin, more equipment to monitor, less equipment. Husband was looking after them better, worse. Mother-in-law was being unkind equally or before. It happens. So it, it, it can be done. That's all I'm trying to say. It's just instead of doing it for nine months, do it for nine years, 19 years, 29 years, 39 years. Coming to what you're saying, I think Archana would perhaps also add to this about, so the kids program, all of these things are very important. It cre it's important for us to understand that a life of a child will be spent in places outside the home so you need to provide an enabling environment and the very there are people who have been scared to inform their school, school that their diabetes. child has diabetes because they, they'll say no no there's too much of a headache for us take your child somewhere else there are no nurse in the school i mean the whole thing is let's say if you want even if you're giving you want to keep your insulin somewhere which is reasonably cool those facilities may or may not be available. So I think programs like this are great because you need to sensitize. The question is not whether the program is required. The question is how do you scale this up? Correct. You know, that is the important thing. Um, and you, I mean, the, the issue about requiring non-physician healthcare providers to chip in, I mean, it's a, not a question. I mean, there's no discussion on it. Obviously, you need them. I mean, no physician can handle a disease which is as complex as diabetes sitting on their own and function like an educator, function like a nutritionist, function like a, you know, it can't be done. But that doesn't mean if you don't have them, you say, oh, we can't do anything because I don't have a nutritionist, because I don't have a nurse. Then you have to do it yourself. But all you need to train somebody who's not trained. I'm going to, I realize we're really short of time. The, the YDR program is, is sort of akin, it's a different version of the suite. I think they are complementary. They basically provide a lot of information. And the information they provide is actually terrifying. The information that they provide is that we're doing a disastrous job, right? And I think the, is the earlier we realize our incompetencies and failures, it's better. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I, I, I can just add to what Banshi said. We were looking at our own sort of clinic data of mortality over the last 40 years. If you're looking at a median survival in India of 70 years, you know, I'm rounding it off. These people who had died, and I have a slide somewhere, uh, they died, died from as young as you know, 10, 11 years to 40 years of age. That means they've lost 30 years, 40 years of their life. It's unacceptable. And you know, we can speak to our heart's content. They were my follow-up patients. I can't say that, okay, they didn't follow up, but they died, right? Next. Right. Thank Just you, Dr. one thing I yeah. want to add that he is so the World Health Organization talked about 100% of them, they should get the insulin. In India, probably many of the states started giving the insulin free below the age of 25. But what is not giving is glucose monitoring yeah. device. That's a challenge. But one very important challenge is also there, they are not provided with education. And I think with World Health Organization also, that 100% of the children, they should be provided insulin also. The insulin, may, I mean, uh, the education also, insulin is provided some of the hospital, but they are just given the insulin. Just taking the insulin does not mean, they may survive for a few more years by taking the insulin, but if the education is not given, they will not be able to achieve a good control. So, so I'm sorry, I know, Banshi, I think what we really need to understand is that for a WHO target, there has to be a measurable metric yes, at yes. the end of it. No, no. So the targets were decided based on 
what is measurable with existing surveys in the member states. Yes, yes. Education, there's no question about it, but it's not a measurable metric. You know, so that's very true, sir. I, I agree with you. That is what, where the organization can work to improve the education. If we educate, even if they get whatever the insulin and the glucose monitoring, because many of them are getting the glucose meter. I just tell you, in LFAC we had given, and for the uh, children with CDIC, almost every child has been given 100 insulin strip and glucose meter, and they were not utilizing it. So if you educate them, then they started utilizing it, and that had really made the change. From 10.5, how we could reduce the nine. Thank you. And Thank still you. in our clinic, we want to have only eight, but we never tell the patient that your educational yeah. target should be. So Dr. Metley, I think we'll uh, ask you some more questions. Yeah. Uh, so. Ma'am, so we spoke about how pregnancy is a game changer moment in the life of a girl or woman with type one diabetes. Can you highlight on the aspects of pre-pregnancy counseling and care? Uh, thank you, Chitra. Uh, the question is how many of us discuss preconceptional counseling in a girl with type 1 diabetes? So this is where we need to focus on. So we today, if you look at the idea of at least 2021, India has the maximum number of children with type 1 diabetes below the age of 20 years and the number of increasing cases per year also India is leading. So the burden of type 1 diabetes girl, uh, female with type 1 diabetes pregnancy is going to increase dramatically. True. Then when should we start preconception counseling? This should be immediately after puberty. Majority of our Indian uh, uh, girls are still having early pregnancies and uh, so this is where we should start. And then what do we discuss? Discuss about planning pregnancy with an A1C goal of 6.5 or 7, so that we minimize uh, fetal, neonatal, maternal, obstetric complications and have a healthy pregnancy. Then what to discuss when the woman is planning pregnancy? Most important is there are some non-edging therapies for type 1 diabetes which are being used like the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, which all need to be discontinued and even ACI ARBs. Then start a prenatal vitamin, the screen for complications, optimize weight, look for thyroid dysfunction. So briefly, this is what we need to look for. And then having said this, remember that 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. Then they come late to us uh, during pregnancy, and there could be a limited access for diabetes care. But however, as uh, Professor Nikhil Tandon aptly mentioned, we have progressed towards healthy pregnancies in majority of our type 1 diabetes women, and we are really happy about it. So the take home message is that talk to women with type 1 diabetes about planning pregnancy, empower them about managing diabetes effectively during pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maitri. So we have one question for Dr. Archana. What are the challenges that girls face in self-management and how do you overcome these challenges? And we are talking about your resource poor as well as those who have resources, both, both the settings. So yeah. the challenges uh, for girls specifically, because now we are uh, taking away the challenges which are common to both genders, but a very specific challenge in school is um, discrimination, especially in girls, space to inject themselves, a place where they can inject, uh, the frequency of use of bathroom if they need it. Mm -hmm. So these things are judged, discriminated, and hence the talk we were uh, in the previous uh, topic when we were talking about a school health program mm -hmm. or talking about the kids program at school, that's very, very important. So especially for girl children, we insist uh, the solution would be to go to a uh, the teacher, the class teacher, the bus driver, the principal, they definitely need to know. So we have a standardized letter, we reach out to the schools, and we found even the rural most school, the Zilla Parishad schools, they're very cooperative. They just need to know how important it is. And we send them a happy page saying that you're so great, you have empowered a child, and you have a lot of appreciation messages to the school and give them a certificate that you have actually supported a child. Right. So that is a major challenge and school place. Uh, when it comes to work and life, women, when they're working, in hospitals or wherever in their jobs 
nine to five jobs, wherever they are, they are very hesitant in revealing that they have type 1 diabetes. They don't want to take the afternoon break. The biggest challenge is taking insulin in school lunch break, taking insulin in the working time, and they always want you to rearrange their schedule and skip their bolus in between. But it takes um, management and replanning. For example, if you give them a fast acting insulin, give them a device which is very discreet, you don't have to wait for half an hour. So here again, these can be overcome and we often are tell them that just use it for that only that much time. So as a result you save money because of that so small Correct. dose, take a lower carb tip in. So these are practical ways we can actually help them uh, control their diabetes in their work environment. But there is a discrimination in office. Would you agree? A psychologist here will chip in. Do you think because they have frequent hypoglycemias or hyperglycemias that there is discrimination if they actually declare that they are type 1? So, so many of my patients don't want to tell their employers that they have type 1 because they fear losing their jobs. Absolutely, ma'am. In fact, this is something that came across across participants they shared. Uh, one was the inhibition to tell at the workplace at the time of recruitment itself because they felt that this would be used against them in uh, you know, not offering the job in the first place. But the other was even if they had uh, taken on the job, then using, uh, you know, uh, injecting themselves while at work. And this was a concern both for, uh, you know, adolescent and young adults, as well as for parents who were thinking about what will happen when my child grows up and joins the workforce. Uh, so one of the things that they talked a lot about, many of the participants, is about, uh, you know, in terms of awareness, can we have workplaces which are better informed and better aware? Can we hold workshops on equal opportunity, non-discrimination, several of the tenets that are enshrined in our constitution? These are not things that somebody is doing as a favor to anyone. So right to uh, you know dignity or non-discrimination is something uh, which is very much there, yeah. and so therefore you know uh, holding workshops at different kinds of workplaces with this kind of a focus, equal opportunity and non-discrimination focus, I think that would be absolutely imperative. Thank you. Now we have uh, one or two questions from the audience. One question is no, okay. yeah. we have okay. Yeah. I'm so uh, sorry. To, uh, yeah. So we still have questions for Shil uh, Shilpa. Yeah, doctor. Dr. Shilpa, uh, maybe you could point us to a few resources, uh, do's and don'ts for physicians to know about uh, what nutritional support can do, where they can access, let's say, I don't have a nutritionist working with me and I'm a standalone doctor. What kind of support can I use, anything that is available online as a digital tool that you've been working with? So, um, if you uh, look at just standardized dietary resources coming from uh, uh, associations in India, they are very few. So, um, uh, typically for type 1 diabetes, while there are a lot of uh, do's and don'ts about uh, nutrition or diet for diabetes in general, there are a lot. But specifically, if you're looking at carb counting guides, etc., there are very few. Uh, there are uh, so one can one can approach a dietitian if you want a specific carb counting uh, resource because that is something she is going to have yes. with her. So. That, that can be done. Uh, besides that, if you uh, go on IDF or ADA site, in general, you are going to get a lot of resources, but they may not be of India-specific foods. So you might not get a chapati or uh, you know whatever, idli or dosa, you might not get. So you would want that to be done. Also, it's very difficult sort of to standardize Indian foods. The reason is uh, it's typically cooked in a different way in every house. So carb content changes uh, dramatically as recipes change from house to house. But uh, a lot of times for very specific care, uh, dietitians actually sit and uh, standardize recipes at the patient's house for it. But if you're looking at general resources, there are a lot of general resources available. Also, there are a lot of digital platforms which are on, and they will help you sort of to get these uh, carb exact carbohydrate values, mm -hmm. at least of ready-to-eat food. So you can get a lot of, uh, even on FSSAI site, you might uh, get some of them. So right. do you teach the patient to read the labels, how many, how much sugar mm -hmm. and yes, reading we, we, labels? Yes, we, we do teach patients to read labels, but after saying that, we do not encourage that patients eat foods out of packets. So that is that is one thing that we do not encourage. So we don't want to eat yes. them. If we don't want them to eat biscuits and cookies yeah, and but you so can't stop. So it's yeah, no, we yeah. can't. So, so while reading that is important, 
because it will help you to sort of take the right dose for the snack. What we encourage is home-based diets, which cannot be labeled because, you know, things, yeah, yeah. they change. And therefore, understanding what is cooked at home and sort of coming on to that carbohydrate ratios are very, very important. Right. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shilpa. Uh, we're ready to take questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Bina is daring to go, as is Dr. Lily. Uh, Dr. Anjana has got to the mic first. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, sir, we are hearing nowadays that we have uh, a lot of people with severe insulin deficiency diabetes in young age. So, young, thin patient, whether it is type 1, which is positive autoimmunity, or whether it is developmentally epigenetic, whatever reason, severe insulin deficiency diabetes. Is there a difference between their natural history and complication profile? Uh, I mean, is it uh, important whether autoimmunity present or not? Will all patients with insulin deficiency behave uh, the same way? Thanks, Dr. Anjali, for that question. So the SI, SI let's look at the context, right? The SIED, so the, all of this actually developed with work at Leaf Group's lab. Yeah, and this was in the context of a phenotypic characterization of type 2 diabetes as, you know, as in the large bucket of type 2 diabetes seeing if their natural history and or complication profile was was variable so you know milder disease severe insulin deficient disease after that there are two data sets from india which have sort of replicated that work a, 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 a dr mohan's group dr yajnik in which i think dr banshi had uh, also contributed uh, and very clearly, if you look at that, you will see in India, not the traditionally significantly overweight people, but those who are present as type 2 use oral agents, but are very often transitioning to insulin early. Unlike the work done by LEAF group, both Indian data sets don't really have significant longitudinal information in terms of the sort of complication profile, which is critical for us to see. Now, if you then go back to work done at the search registry, they will give you four phenotypic profiles of youth onset diabetes. The two extreme profiles are very classical. You know, young onset ketosis from antibody positive, young onset overweight, insulin resistant. Then comes a mixed profile, and then one which is indeterminate, which could be possibly consequent to monogenic syndromes or whatever. Now, the, answering your question is, again, a lot of this, so a lean young onset diabetes safety demands that you start insulin with them irrespective of whatever and I fortunately happen to be also on part of the WHO classification diagnosis committee which we changed the classification last time around you know the so-called Japanese variant went out and I essentially made the point that what is most important when I'm sitting in the clinic do I let that patient leave with an insulin prescription or without an insulin prescription, right? And that's all that's really important. The antibodies will be supplementary. You're not going to get them in real time in any case. No, absolutely, sir. So there's no question about putting them on insulin or oral antidiabetes medication. The question is if those people are uh, auto uh, uh, antibody positive, whether we do it or not, they will be more prone for other autoimmune disorders. So. Uh, Fair enough. But so, is there any difference in clinical approach towards them? So, is, is so something again, it's it's perhaps better to believe and treat them as if they are an autoimmune variant. Look out for coexistent disease, and what is you will get it. You will get for that age group. You will get a TSH and TPO done periodically. You will get a TTG periodically. You will also get supported by family history of other autoimmune endocrinopathies. So that's as far in terms of complications, they'll be driven less by the antibodies and more how we manage the patient or how the patient be managed. Right. Sir, I am Dr. Krishna Prashanti representing Tirupati. My question is, uh, Dr. Banshi Sabusar was uh, giving an important statement that pediatricians have never seen the complications. I think uh, at that point I would request you because we are seeing many of the poor patients who are deprived of insulin 
and in our state sometimes we are getting short of the insulin for the free supply i can request you from this forum that we can make a statement or a request to the all the government teaching hospitals in the pediatric ward itself a separate pediatric diabetic clinic can be there not in the institutes where you are having endocrinology departments where that all the poor children at the same institute where you can afford a dietitian or an endocrinologist or a retinopathy screening and everything at a single point where the patient is able to get because a poor child parent cannot afford to lose his daily labor to go for a frequent visits to the hospital once they are given the insulin at that local primary health centers they can give given the free insulins so some of the government hospital and tertiary care hospital now starting dedicate a type for diabetes screening in gujarat we have started at a two place one at sola civil hospital which is again so they have running diabetes clinic which is under the department of internal medicine uh, now after discussion with so many times with the government also now we are starting at sola civil which is a, again with medical college a dedicated type one diabetes clinic which will run only once in a week on saturday where a adult physician as well as pediatrician both the residents will be there along with the a nutritionist and a psychologist and the insulin will be provided provided free and it will not be for one month it will be minimum supply will be for three months so this is what in rajasthan government with we have our friend dr sudhir bandari as a rajasthan uh, medical health university chancellor vice chancellor we have already done at a kota in medical college and one other which is getting open in jaipur also as a dedicated type for diabetes clinic so probably this model may work with the tertiary care hospital where the department of endocrinology is not there they may run a dedicated type one diabetes clinic with the support of medicine department and pediatrician department so both the resident will look after that and we are trying to do it through the rssdi and the education and all knowledge partner probably the rssdi will be the knowledge partner for that thank you sir Uh, while we are waiting for Dr. Mary to get the summary ready, we'll take Dr. Lily's question. Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to share a real-world uh, uh, experience that I recently had. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Rakesh and Niraveni from Hyderabad and myself, went to a rural place about 90 kilometers from our center, urban areas, and then uh, we had about 200 adults, out of which four were children. <laughs> and they were type ones and then one girl out of these four children was you know she could not lift her hand to show her finger uh, for the prick and then we saw that her sugar was very high it was high and then when we asked the mother the pathetic story was that she had to look after the family by doing the daily labor work and she could not she was a diagnosed child by the way so she could not give her insulin and the child could not go to school that day so there was no insulin given to her that not only that day the two or three previous days and the, her father the baby's father was 24 hours alcohol so in this scenario how do we tackle these children i think this is not the uh, you know one case alone i'm sure uh, archana has many more examples like these so when we sit and talk about urban clinics and urban care uh, what do we have to offer to the majority of our i mean even in the rural areas i think type, type 1 is increasing uh, day by day so i think this is a very common scenario yeah. this is i have hundreds of children who come from this background and first thing is i what was very well emphasized by dr banji was no premixed I mean, if you look at the insulin therapy itself, I'm talking from there, that if we could put them on basal bolus, and today it's possible. So minimum care has to be redefined. And if a child is on basal insulin, which today we can access, you can reach out to Dr. Banshi, you can reach out to me, we'll connect you somewhere. There are NGOs all over the country. There's LFAC, there's CDIC, there are so many pharma support programs. And because of the boluses, then at least immediate crisis become less. We know that hypoglycemias and flexibility of regime helps the rural even more because they are the ones who really need the best of therapies that here, is one excuse me yes. here the problem was mother yes I mean, was illiterate yes. and she couldn't inject yes. she didn't know how to But, do it uh, that is the second point i was coming to that everyone can learn it the onus is on us i mean uh, how to teach literacy has nothing to do with injection technique unless as long as their hand motor coordination is happening 
there is absolutely no reason. I asked them, can you make a chapati? If you can make a chapati, you can inject insulin. Correct. There is no way that they can't. So the onus is on us to design methods. So what we do in villages, we have visual teaching. We uh, teach through dances, we teach through folk songs, we do hand-holding. So we need a dedicated team which can teach them in the way they understand. But everyone can learn. Everyone can learn how to inject and do a, and numeral literacy is not there. So only thing that we require with a glucometer is a numeral literacy. So I know it's a tough situation, but yeah. we have had neighbors injecting in when the mother is in the field or the nearest pharmacy, the child can go and get the school teachers we have trained. So my point here is it's tough, but we can strive for one level better. So the minimal level has to be not minimal. Today we have to say that the minimal level cannot be give a premix and no monitoring and just survive. So the minimal level has to be a basal bolus regime, few monitorings, education. And if it is not there, we are striving for the next level. Search for, reach out, yeah. put it on the RSSDS site and hundreds of people will come and help you. So I think Archana will have to stop. One last question from Dr. Bina Bansal and then we wind up this. No, one last question, Bina. Please. Okay. So we have, uh, yeah, yes, doctor, go ahead. This is the last question because we are running short of time. Uh, Inviting Dr. Mo Mary. To and then a question. This is an appreciation. It's been a wonderful uh, lecture. Being a practicing gynecologist and now in South Delhi seeing a lot of type 1 diabetes in patients, uh, preconception counseling. It's good to see the educated coming forward themselves. But also we are trying, just as we are targeting, you know, young adults for the HPV vaccination, we start talking starts. about this <laughs> to them while they are just coming to us uh, for vaccinations also, number one. Number two, we are also trying that uh, we get, at least I in my clinic, try to get together. If I have a type 1 diabetic early pregnancy patient, I get her in contact with a couple of those who've delivered with me and communicate with them to build up their confidence. So a family meeting, and this has really helped me and helped my patients also. So meeting with others who've been through this is one approach that really helps in the obstetric practice. Thank you. So I think we'll wind up and I want to emphasize the six P's of managing a type 1. So the patient, the physician, the peer, which she just mentioned. So people who have the principal or the school, you involve the teachers, the psychologist, and we have one sitting here. So if you remember the five or the six P's, the psychologist, the patient, the physician, the parent, the peer, and the principal of the school. So that's the way forward. The six P program for management of type 1 diabetes, including psychological support. So I would like to now hand it over to, first to sum up to Dr. Belinda. <laughs> Dr. Mary. Oh, Mary, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Jabra, and thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Chitra, for that wonderful moderation. Um, may I request the IT help to put on the slides? I'm sorry. Uh, so we had all the questions, and I'm sure the audience was really focused on them. I'm just taking the answers that the uh, eminent physicians gave us. So I will begin with uh, Dr. Nikhil Tandon, who said that data is variable and diabetic ketoacidosis source is most common now. The evolution of puberty is delayed and so is menarche. And all this is actually linked to the glycemic variability the management is both biological and non-biological, and social implications are definitely there in Indian context. Uh, not so familiar with antibodies data or profiling, and the zinc transporter antibodies or the insulin antibodies are really not possible. And as we all know here, it's so difficult Oh, okay, get. So the, uh, the focus was that it's a complex disease and physicians have to address all the issues, albeit with the help of nutritionists and educators. Mortality is high, totally unacceptable, but a measurable matrix is needed. And what doctor focused on was the WHO, which has come up with five targets that for diabetics, 80% of the diabetics should be diagnosed, 
80% must have an HbA1c target of less than 8%. 80% should have a blood pressure less than 130 by 80, 60% should be on statins, and the crux is here. 100% of our diabetics, whether type 1 or type 2, should get insulin and monitoring devices. So that was Dr. Nikhil Tandon's take. Now Dr. Archana Sharda's questions that she answered with her uh, great work on type 1's, age group acceptance of gender is the same by families, but concerns in girls, especially the mothers, have regarding whether the child will have uh, a normal pregnancy, delivery, and would the children also develop diabetes. And this worry is greatest for mothers as compared to the fathers. Family support is less in the girls with type 1 than in boys and discrimination is evident. In schools and in social office workplaces, access to bathrooms, places to inject insulin are the challenges and taking insulin, there's a tendency to skip doses whether in school or in office. Dr. Priyanka Padi, uh, of course, uh, with her experience, commented on the uh, Arthur Kleinman sociologist differentiating between health, disease, and suffering, and how families cope with it. Using insulins at school and work is challenging, so she recommends workshops for equal opportunity for non-discrimination to be uh, conducted as workshops and gender sensitivity issues. Dr. Banshi Sabu uh, has done a lot of work with uh, diabetics, and his questions were on post-COVID incidence of type 2. It, the data is really not available. However, uh, probably the reporting is more, as more patients are now aware and going for uh, counseling to doctors. So education and empowerment are essential for diabetics, whether they are type 1 or type 2. However, with intensive control with glucose monitoring and education, HbA1c's of 8% are possible. Even 7% is possible with continuous glucose monitoring and pumps with low or no hypoglycemia. And that is an achievement in the studies he has done. Focus should be on HbA1c's less than 7% but without hypoglycemia. Insulin being provided but no education being given is of no use. So they go hand in hand. Dr. Maithili uh, responded to the most important question of uh, body image, which is universal but more so in type 2 uh, diabetic uh, adolescents and also with type 1. And Indian data is lacking in eating disorders. We need to suspect an eating disorder if patients report with anorexia nervosa or bulimia, or they come with diabetic ketoacidosis. Dibulimia is, of course, a condition where patients omit insulin to maintain weight. And this is a particular issue for type 1 diabetics. So we need to screen all type 1 diabetic patients between the age of 10 to 12 for eating disorders using simple questionnaires, evaluate the insulin regimen and see if there is a problem there with their missing or their insulin doses. Negative body imaging, psychological disorders, etc., actually give rise to the eating disorders. Pre-pregnancy counseling, she focused that girls below the age of 20 years are the maximum in India, and so we need to focus on them with early counseling at the adolescence. Reduce HbA1c to below 6.5 for pre-pregnancy counseling. Discontinue uh, ARBs, GLP-1s, or DPP-4 if they are on them. And since patients report to us late, we need to be aggressive in management during pregnancy. Her focus was on talk to patients, empower, and train them pre-pregnancy. The most important uh, context of food, which is all physicians have to answer regarding food was addressed by Dr. Shilpa Joshi, and she focused on nutritionists handling food planning. But as Dr. Nikhil also said, we have to be all in one. At times, we don't have access to nutritionists and educators, and so we need to focus on uh, nutrition by ourselves. Patients also listen to physicians, as well as to be endorsed by the uh, nutritionists. So total calories are very important, particularly in type 1 diabetics. We cannot focus on lowering their carbs. Rather, we need to teach them 
carb counting. There are very few carb counting aids according to Dr. Shilpa, but you can see them on IDF and ADA sites. However, they are not friendly to Indian foods. So there are some, uh, because of the diversity of Indian meals, we have some digital platforms uh, which give exact carb values and they can be accessed. Uh, okay, these were just the questions. So with that, I wind up that almost all of them focused on educating and empowering our type 1 diabetics. Thank you so much.